Hi everyone, uh, my name is Daniel. I am the training officer at Campbelltown Australs. Uh, and what we're gonna be doing over this series of videos is record a essentially a, a practice prep based on one of the motions that has come from the rounds uh, at Australs. And obviously at Australs, you get given three motions. Uh, so we will we'll, we'll attempt to do one. And if we're feeling uh, uh, happy and, and full of energy, we'll, we'll go through to do, do another motion for you. Um, but it'll just give you a, a flavor of what a uh, high level prepping looks like. I'll be bringing in different uh, judges throughout the tournament who will also be, be waiting, uh, obviously, while all the teams are prepping to, to complete their prep, uh, for us to have a little bit of a chat about the motions that came from the round prior uh, and the ways in which we would prep them uh, and we would get them done. So what I like to do when I prep is I always start the debate with a silent prep. Uh, and in my uh, silent prep, I think about two things. I think about what is the comparative in this debate? What are the two things that are being compared between the teams? Because you've got if you've got any ambiguity here, it's easy for a team to outflank you. If you build these beautiful sand castles on, on, on uh, unstable foundations, they can all come crumbling down. If you don't have a clear picture of what does the opposition support, what do I support? And then I think about the framework, which is essentially not just from my perspective, Perspective, but from any team in the debate's perspective, what are the things that the judge might care about? What are the arguments uh, that that might play well with them? And how are they going to be fitting uh, into my uh, uh, in, into the way that I approach the debate? So I am joined uh, by Jess. Uh, Jess is obviously an Austral's champion. Uh, she is a uh, world's chief adjudicator for Madrid World. Uh, and she's very, very uh, nicely agreed to, to sit with me. I think it's quite late where she is. So it's also a useful way for to, to keep her um, uh, alive until the, the next debate starts. Uh, but but she's uh, going to help me do this first debate based on the round one motions uh, from Austral's. So Jess, what are the things you focus on uh, when you are doing your prep? Uh, look, very similar to yourself, um, and I 100% agree with all of that. I think in addition to that, um, something that I'm uh, lately very discerning about is trying to make sure I understand exactly what the motion is asking very thoroughly, and in particular, pay attention to particular burdens of the motion um, from its particular wording. So just as an example, you know, if it's a rise of debate, I want to make sure that I'm focusing on the rise of component rather than, than just the thing that comes after it. Or if it's a narrative of X, making sure I'm, you know, discussing, um, you know, what that narrative means. Because I think a lot of the times, you know, if it's a motion about advanced economy should do X, am I thinking about the particular context of the advanced economy and not just what X entails. So I think it's about all of those things because um, so many times I've kind of gone 25 minutes into prep and realized this debate is actually about, you know, this very similar but slightly different thing. Mm -hmm. So that's probably, I think, the main difference that sticks out to me. And obviously, like, being as preemptive as possible with arguments. If I'm struggling for arguments, the first place I will start is what is opposition going to run and then how can I kind of flip that? Mm. For me, I think often those types of questions fall under what is the comparative. And you're right. If you spend 25 minutes of your prep, uh, or in fact, you give your first speech, and then it's the first speech of the negating team who rudely awakens you to this other aspect of the debate, that's often where, where you can go wrong. Uh, and so making sure you're thorough in that early stage of prep, uh, this is why being silent for that first little bit is important. You're letting three different brains approach the problem, and often someone will have a different angle on it that they'll bring up to you, and then you'll try and uh, crush into, into, into what the version of the debate needs to be collectively between you. Those types of questions is often what you leave the silent prep with. Uh, and the goal is not to come out from the silent prep being like, the case is this, point one, point two, point three. The point of the silent prep is to really get to grips with the motion and then listen to how the other people have gotten the grips of the motion. And that's why I'm quite lucky uh, to have Jess with me. Obviously, she will have a very wildly different perspective on each debate uh, that, than, uh, than I will. Um, we have prepped together before and uh, I actually can't remember <laughs> whether that was our experience, uh, but you will get to, to, to see, it, see it live playing out in front of you. So the motion that we're going to discuss first uh, and like all good debaters, Jess is going to be writing this down furiously, uh, is the third motion in the Austral's round one set, which is that labor unions in the tertiary education sector should deprioritize strikes in favor of administration bans. Uh, and then there's a little bracketed section, uh, i.e. continuing to teach, but refusing to grade papers, oversee exams, answer emails. So 
Jess and I are going to do two minutes of silent prep starting now. Um, and then afterwards, we'll just as we would in an ordinary prep, have a little discussion, download our different perspectives on the debate, and then unify them towards our case. Uh, in this debate, I will be the first speaker. So I will be the one who's gathering all of that material and try and put in a speech. And I'll, and I'll uh, tell you guys what that looked like, uh, obviously, after we finish prepping. Uh, and if we get to a second round, Jess is going to play that role. So we have two minutes starting now. Okay, excellent. That's two minutes. Jess, what are your thoughts? Um, so I kind of, I, you'll probably be better at the broader framing stuff because my brain uh, uh, it actually just kind of left straight to arguments. But um, I do think it's worth noting from the outset, this is like not an actor debate. This is like a broad mm. interest debate. So obviously um, we can characterize a number of different interests, not only the students, but presumably those of who are uh, striking. And, you know, if we need to, we can outweigh those aims with those of like those benefits with those of students. Um, but uh, I think there's probably inevitably going to be a large point about um, students, namely just that ongoing education is useful for them keeps their minds active. Um, it also prevents like large catching up of content that is uh, likely to produce lots of stress in students at like particularly volatile periods, et cetera, et cetera. So um, like it doesn't really affect a student so much if their paper is not graded, but if they have to then catch up on massive content at the end of a semester or whatever, that's probably quite bad for them. Um, I wonder if there's material about why this is actually better for the labor union themselves in terms of this kind of still I guess uh, pissing enough people off that it will draw attention to it um, because presumably management and administrators and like those higher ups who are controlling their pay want to see something done. Um, but this then at least strikes a balance and allows them to retain some sympathy with students who are probably their biggest support base. Um, I also think thirdly, you can probably ap apply this in a somewhat of a macro way. Like um, unions are seen as increasingly out of touch um, in many societies. This, arguably paints them as a little bit more sympathetic, maybe bypasses some need for governments to do more crackdowns. I think maybe the limitation of this argument, though, is that um, this is only in the education sector. So I don't know if there's as much of a tipping point there. Um, finally, I wonder if I didn't quite complete this thought, but if we can characterize maybe unions being too quick to jump to full industrial action, maybe this is like a measured something something but i honestly didn't quite get there in the time <laughs> yeah so um 
what I was doing while Jess was speaking, and, and often there'll be a person in your team whose job it is is really to be a scribe, to reflect things back and to pull things together. And that, that's, that's often uh, the first speaker or, or the person who's giving the reply, because obviously they then need to th th then give that speech. Um, what I was doing while Jess was speaking is essentially just like uh, logging each of her thoughts into a like thorough and, and broad framework. And different different people like get onto that framework stuff, uh, resist the siren call of arguments uh, a little bit a little bit longer uh, than other people. So what I'll do is just walk you through now what I've got down on my sheet of paper. So I've got two uh, sides on my sheet of paper, one addressing the comparative, what are we comparing in this debate, and then other addressing the framework. So what are the different things that we might care about? So the first thing that Jess identifies uh, should have hit every single debater straight on the nose, uh, and that's that this is a should debate. So uh, that, that has huge, huge impacts on the way that we play um, play out the the, the, the the framework that exists within the debate. But you just essentially, when you're thinking about the comparative, it is useful to go through each word in the motion and ask yourself, what does that word mean? And obviously, should is very important. And obviously, we're talking about labor unions. So this is not individuals. Um, uh, pursuing limited negotiation tactics. This is about broad groups of workers who are pursuing a collective bargaining strategy. So then we have to think about then, well, what is the comparative in this debate? Uh, and on the one hand, we have strikes. And on the other side, we have an admin ban. So you should go through and think about what are the things that distinguish uh, the, those, 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 two, um, the, those two different policy standpoints. So a strike, and, and just was getting at this, is quite full non-compliance, right? It's much broader than just an admin ban. And this debate, actually, when you think about it, is quite interesting because it's about essentially saying uh, it, it, the two policies are not necessarily like truly mutually exclusive, because many of the things you do in an admin ban are probably things you are also doing in your in a strike, but it is much more intense. And we should think about the ways in which that plays out, what the other um, aspects of a strike are. Obviously, that's full non-compliance, so you're not teaching just identifies. That's probably one of the big differences in one you still teach and the other you don't teach, and the, and the motion helps you along with that. Um, but, but likely, it's something you can hold for much less time, right? Um, it really cripples the functioning of that university. And if you just look at the way in which the motion is framed, uh, the way in which the examples of the motion are framed, it gives the impression that the admin ban is something that rolls with time. It's something that wears down the university over a longer period of time. And that's something that might build immediately into how we're thinking about this comparative. So the way I'm approaching it at the end of thinking about the comparative is, is this is about what labor unions, collective bargainers should do. And it's about whether they should engage in a short, very intense action that is likely to cripple the function of a university, or they should engage in a essentially war of attrition against the unity university, targeting specific factors uh, or specific functions that these academics might play out. And of course, we're given some examples in the motion. So those are things that we know are going to play into it. And I'll think about there, is there anything else uh, that might be a useful example uh, of that type of admin ban? But I, th but I think they they broadly uh, cover it. It might be like not going to meetings or not filling out the forms necessary to help the person do timetable scheduling. So, so really just throwing sand into the gears then. And then we take what Jess was saying uh, about the different arguments that might play out in this debate. And, and I'll encourage you to not necessarily dive in too strongly to arguments at the first instance, because that's how you can get blindsided by an argument from the opposition. But you'll note that Jess had already internalized that type of uh, framework thinking. So she was asking, essentially, when she addressed what you should do, uh, talked about the different stakeholders that might be involved. And obviously, students are very important in this debate. And we care about the teachers. Um, uh, and I know that you don't have to care about the teachers to the exclusion of other groups. And you don't even have to care about the teachers even like having a better wage, right? You should question your assumptions in a should debate, especially when there's an actor that should or should not. Because you could totally say, teachers are overpaid in the status quo. They're a highly privileged group of academics within society. And sure, they might have a unique ability to bargain for higher wages, but they shouldn't do that. So make sure you're not jumping towards a conclusion uh, when something out of left field could then undermine that uh, conclusion. And what I was thinking about from what Jess was saying is obviously we care about students. And so one of the first things that we have to weigh is the harm of these different policies. Uh, and Jess explained to us that there's going to be potentially less learning under one side or the other. It creates volatility one side or the other. Other, and we should probably characterize what students are losing under a strike versus another model within that context of one being short and intense and one being slightly longer uh, and having more, more attrition. Then we probably will also think about the interests of the teachers. And I, I think it might actually be difficult to say that teachers shouldn't be paid better. There's a number of reasons why they structurally struggle to get wages that they might otherwise be able to get. Um, and also, of course, noting that happier teachers might mean happier students. So looking for the relationship between those frameworks and why a well-paid 
engaged teacher might be able to deliver a better education and a better time for the students means you can kind of get that symmetry. And the last thing that I really like to just talk about uh, was the structure. And I think this goes just beyond are you able to negotiate for a better wage? It might also go to how stable is your union? How strong is your union? This is not just a like a, a battle. This is a war that goes on for a long period of time. Uh, and the structures and whether those structures get stronger or whether those structures get weaker when you essentially use your powder are very important to how this debate might play out. And so that we then turn into a series of points. I often like have a little bit on just setting up what I was doing in that comparative and then walking through essentially each of those interests. Why do students suffer less from the direct impacts of this action. My second point, why is this more effective at getting the interests of teachers looked after? And then impact in that point, why is that good for teachers? Why is that good for students? And then why is that good for unions as an institution uh, and an explanation of why unions are important? Nice, Jess. Now that you've heard, uh, essentially <laughs> reflecting back a lot of the, the thoughts that you were telling me through the framework that I'd been thinking about, are, is there anything that we still need to, to think about or work out before we start fleshing out those points? Um, I think you've done a good job of uh, covering all of that. I will say, though, the I think the discussion you had about um, how this will just like practically play out, for example, duration, then got me thinking about potentially other arguments that get mm -hmm. enlivened as a result of that. So, for example, one thing that occurred to me um, is that, you know, obviously if something goes on even longer, that's potentially worse for teachers because they've got to continue mm. that action. On the other hand, though, I was thinking, is there a way to flip this? So maybe when this action is seen as less um, adverse, uh, the universities will try to take away some of their privileges more, uh, less less so. Yeah. So, like, if, you know, if you're not working at all, arguably there's, like, more cause for the university to not pay you, whereas at least if you're teaching a little bit, that's harder to justify. So uh, anyway, long story short, uh, I think it's helpful to consider those things because often that will then give you more ideas yeah. for argument. And I think what we have here is almost like an equilibrium, right? Because you're harming the university and they might retaliate against you or they might concede to you. So essentially what we're trying to find in this debate is the sweet spot of where do you get the most university compliance with the least university retaliation. And you can situate this in a broad realm of different responses. So like obviously student, like, like teacher unions could engage in terrorism. That's a very extreme way of putting your interest to someone. Uh, and, and obviously is never suggested in the context of bargaining for better pay because it will only lead to retaliatory response rather than a, rather than a concessionary response. So we'll need to be thinking in the way that we construct that point. And, and that might be just one of our main points. Why does this hit the sweet spot of making the university listen to the interests of teachers without becoming reactionary and, and uh, dismissing the interests of teachers. Um, and so that might be something that is valuable for us. What I also really liked is just was able then to explain that we also know, don't just need to be thinking about the costs of this policy on students, but uh, in, in the implementation, but we should also think about the costs of the policy on the teachers. They might having to be giving up pay. They might have to, it might be particularly stressful for them to have to deal with that admin when they come back from the strike. Like there's, there's a number of things that you can be thinking about here. And everything that I was doing while Jess was speaking was folding that into the prep that we were doing so that now we have, I think, a, like a really solid set of points. And the next step would be to develop, uh, to develop those, to develop those points. Um, but we're not going to develop those points because that is the end of our, uh, our, our basically mini practice prep where we explain the way that we are able to play out this motion. Um, nice, great. Any any thoughts on how that went, Jess? Uh, I think, you know, obviously we've got slightly different, like maybe conceptual styles. So like I tend to sometimes go into the arguments and then that will, for me, frame the characterization mm. and framing that follows. Um, and obviously you start in the reverse, which is perfectly fine. And I think it's just like, um, it's about merging those like kind of different prep instincts and communicating those with your partner so they kind of know what to expect. I think in general, most of the time, you should probably defer a lot to whoever's speaking first because they're the one that that needs to get the arguments to paper. But it will obviously just depend on the team itself. Um, and as long as you have good communication, it should be fine. Yeah, I'd really echo that. I think the 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 complementarity of styles is quite important. Someone who preps slightly different to you, and this is why you should do silent preps, um, mm -hmm. brings a different wealth to the wealth to the motion and how you're able uh, to address it. And I'd also say that you don't need to necessarily come to a single unitary way for the team to 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 think about their their prep styles because obviously as long as you're on the same uh, on the same page about uh, 
the, the case that is going to be run, the important facts, facets of this case, we obviously don't expect first speakers, second speakers, and third speakers to structure their speeches in the same way. Um, and, and even if the, the first speaker has a particular way they want to address the motion, the way that your brain situates within, within a motion and is able to tie ideas together uh, is very important. And the work that we've just done here, and this is why I, I love writing during prep, making sure that I'm, I'm building up this, this wealth of material that I can then uh, see clearly on the page and then roll out in a debate when I don't have that much time to think about it, um, I, it, it is, is very helpful for when you're getting into it. So that's the end of the first practice prep. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, and we'll see you for the next round.